Did someone turn the heat up? Because I was born for this one. Ever since fire damage was added to Payday 2 back in 2015, I've been fascinated by the idea of purifying Washington DC with the cleansing flames of the flamethrower MK1. Something in the back of my mind has been telling me to burn over and over again, and if you think that was unhinged, just you wait. Step into the picture, Team Fortress 2's most sociopathic killer, Pyro. A hallucinating pyromaniac with the most brutal arsenal of murder tools ever made available to me in a challenge run. This one is going to be a real barn burner. Time to set murky water ablaze and throw another piece of coal on the flames of love. But as with any good challenge run, we do need some rules to keep things from getting too out of hand. We're using the same template as usual, aiming to set off a wildfire in career mode, raging from the bank heist to the White House, hard resetting Yelwant once again as he faces his most extreme transformation so far. As ever with these role-playing runs, there are a number of specific weapons we're allowed to deal damage with based on their correspondence with TF2 equivalents. It was a little harder with Pyro than some of the previous classes, but essentially I've boiled it down to allowing pure fire damage weapons and banning almost every other form of damage. In essence, I want this to be a fire-only run for as far as physically possible, so despite shotguns existing within Pyro's loadout, I've made the tough call to ban them for this challenge regardless of Dragon's Breath rounds. This might disappoint some of you, but I'd hate to end up just leaning on shotguns and missing out on the whole point of the challenge. However, there are a few additional weapons available that you might not have considered. First up, whilst Payday still doesn't have a flare gun, what it does have is incendiary grenade launchers. Most of these still deal a fair bit of explosive damage, except for the recently added Basilisk 3V. For whatever reason, it only does 10 damage up front per grenade, which makes it incredibly unlikely to actually kill anyone with anything but the afterburn, meaning it just about qualifies as a pyro-certified weapon. Let's be honest, this is a necessity anyway, with Panic Room and Brooklyn 1010 being career mode roadblocks without some sort of ranged option. Almost just as iconic as Pyro's Flames are their melee options, from fire axes and sledgehammers to a garden rake or a rubber glove. Back in my TF2 playing days, Pyro's were consistently a menace with their extinguisher combos, so I want to heavily weave melee into the build. Within Payday 2, that means we gain access to the fire axe, tenderizer, ding dong breaching tool, bearded axe, survival tomahawk, and amusingly, thanks to the jungle inferno update, anything that functions as an empty fist weapon, such as the empty palm cata. Finally, we are allowed to use the Molotov throwable, incendiary grenade, and I guess the throwing axe just to fit in with the axe fascination Pyro seems to hold. As ever, we start out at level 0, infamy 0, and are not allowed to grind for money or experience outside of the career mode heist. Everything must be played solo, offline. Cray Eye is always allowed for stealth heist but cannot be active in loud. Mods will be kept to the absolute minimum on this one after the madness of the Jokemon run, but I will still be using a Hood mod, Vanilla Hood Plus, and a Pyrovision Goggles Mask mod just to get into the correct headspace. Finally, we will always play Heist on the highest available difficulty, capping at Deathwish, meaning Mayhem up to level 80 and Deathwish from then onwards. Lifelines are back, as we're bringing along Drop Difficulty, allowing a single-use reduction of difficulty by one stage, Crew Support, enabling us to enter a Loud Heist with Team AI turned on, and the recently added Rule Breaker, enabling me to bend the rules for a single heist. Remember, on the Jokemon run, I allow myself to shoot only yellow marked enemies on Brooklyn 1010 with this lifeline, so any future rule break needs to be similarly limited. That said, let's get prepped for the run. Spy Duke is no more as we reset the account once again. With my starting continental coins, I'm able to pick up Invigorator, Accelerator and Concealer for the crew AI, as well as equipping my Molotov, which unlocks at level 0, meaning for once, I immediately have a way to deal proper damage. I'm also lucky enough to start with access to my own fists, meaning the Dukes are up and ready as an initial melee weapon. As for our heister, the Payday Gang fears no man, but that thing within their crew, Jacket, scares them sufficiently to be our pyro proxy for this run. We hand him the Pyrovision goggles to wear, alongside the raincoat for more of a yellow pyro look. I also decide to go out of my way to spend £2.49 on the McShay mod pack for access to the recently added ordnance bag. This piece of equipment failed to set the world on fire when it was released, but it might just come in handy early in this run. You see, in the spirit of playing a crazed arsonist, instead of doing a usual stealth heist to start things off, I found a Mayhem 4 stores on Crime Net, which I could attempt to clear and achieve those initial 10 levels as brutally as possible. Going loud off the back, I was perkless, skillless, and without a usable primary or secondary weapon, but did have 15 total Molotovs to try and swing things in my favour. Unfortunately, holding out in the China store wasn't ideal, as whilst the sustained area denial allowed me to control one entrance easily enough, when the cops worked out they could breach the back door, I was met with a one-two punch takedown from that overpowered early game cop melee. 
Holding at the convenience store instead was infinitely easier as I could keep my back to the wall whilst waiting out drills. In fact on run 2 I was able to secure the loot required and just need to hold out for the van, but then made the mistake of refusing to cancel my lot picking animation, taken down by a single swat, once again by a pretty optimal close range melee burst. This encouraging run was followed by a cascade of attempts that were either foiled by the spawn of a bulldozer, another monstrously powerful melee attack taking three quarters of my health in a single swing, or embarrassingly my own Molotov damage. I even tried stealthing this one a few times, but it felt almost impossible with all the camera spawns and without access to silent drilling, resulting in failure regardless. Eventually, I was lucky enough to get god RNG with no cameras overlocking a large safe, only to be painfully disappointed when there wasn't enough loot inside to help me reach the 15,000 marker. This forced me out of my hiding place to secure some loose loot, and of course brought us loud again. All seemed to be fine though, as I was able to set up a blockade within the one way entrance of a potential escape location. But eventually, this holdout was doomed by the spawn of a green dozer, who I comedically evaded for over 30 seconds with the assistance of a drop shield, until accidentally wandering into my own fire damage, failing this attempt. Clearly the raincoat is a little more flammable than Pyro's usual getup. To be frank though, I wasn't about to spend another 10 minutes on flaming 4 stores, and wasn't quite prepared for the level of murder required of me at this point, meaning I was left to scramble for less of a gung-ho approach. Fortunately, a Ukrainian job appeared on CrimeNet and provided me exactly that, heading in, giving these two lads the hot hand round the back, before controlling the interior and drilling the Titan safes. A slow and less fiery approach, but infinitely easier to get the basics done. Now level 26, I was able to upgrade my fist to the empty palm kata, and spend my skill points on joker skills for an early distraction, alongside transporter and drill sergeant to reduce the time I'd need to spend risking my life on the upcoming heist. Shot proof was also a necessity, as I'd be without a viable damage dealing weapon until level 44, and didn't want to fail an attempt due to accidental rule breaking. I also equipped Sociopath, the only perk deck that really fits with Pirate's personality, immediately giving me damage reduction and a huge buff to consecutive melee strikes. After putting on the heaviest armour available to me at this point, I headed into the standard bank heist. Here I attempted a bit of a pseudo stealth approach, but that went south fairly quickly, forcing us back to loud. And here's why you should never lean too much on sociopath's melee utility. 10 times damage sounds like a lot, but it's nowhere near enough to compete with the kind of damage mayhem cops are putting out at close range. Not to mention the disorientating knockback thermal thrusting me straight into custody. Stealth went much better on run 2, taking out cameras early on, before spotting this guard going walkabouts around the outskirts of the bank. In all my years playing Payday 2, I cannot remember ever seeing security choose to take this pathing option, giving me the golden opportunity to stall on him with what has to be one of the first ever stealth Molotov kills. If that isn't pyromancy at its finest, I don't know what is, although my hubris was soon punished as the manager was spotted tied up in the bank, resulting in things immediately going loud. Now well, this time I was smart enough to keep my distance from the cops, leading them on a chase around the bank's many corners, Molotoving as I went. Finally, I can say that that was £2.50 well spent on the ordnance bag, as the extra mollies gave me the space to finally take a joker, who provided enough distraction to grab a bag of cash and escape from the rooftop. Of course, it was just my luck to get an escape mission from this very early heist, rolling the sniper escape, which can be a huge problem early on, but for whatever reason, these guys couldn't land a shot on me, resulting in a rapid clear and the bullet dodger achievement for good measure. Before heading into Jewelry Store, I was able to grab a couple more perks in Sociopath, alongside some melee skills to buff one of my only sources of damage for this heist. But that wouldn't be necessary, at least right now, as I was comfortably able to drill the back safe before simply controlling the front side of the store which was populated by the least observant civilians I have ever seen, completely failing to react to Smash Glass and a bunch of their cowering compatriots. With that kind of AI, this one was always going to be a simple clear, grabbing as much extra loot as I could to prepare the ludicrously expensive weapons I'd soon have access to. With that stealth experience going as well as it did, I decided to go down the same route for Diamond Store, not bringing along crew AI just in case things went loud. That was until I realised I wasn't physically able to lockpick access to the security room when there was a camera overlocking it, so I instead decided to commit to the whole stealth thing with a more complete build and bots in tow. This was easy enough, as the guards conga line their way up to the second floor to each receive a quick throat chop, allowing me to switch off the alarms and take control of the entire store. And by control, I mean home wreck just about everyone who couldn't be cable tied thanks to Sixth Sense Aced, leading to another safe and easy stealth clear. 
but if there's one thing you can be sure of, it's that I'm not going to choose to stealth go bank unless someone's holding a gun to my head. So despite being so close to level 44 and access to my first flamethrower, I was still willing to once again revamp the bill with loud gameplay in mind, even if it meant I was relying on a few molotovs and my bare fists. Using Jack of All Trades, I was able to drag along the ordnance bag alongside the incredibly useful first aid kits. Unfortunately, even with all that extra survivability and shot-proof equipped, it was actually a taser who put an end to run one, holding me in place for seven whole seconds whilst all his mates gave me the third degree. But other than that instant, I was surprised by how beatable this had felt, so I headed straight back in to resume my corner hiding, Molotov strategy. Of course, snipers spawned as soon as I went to assemble the cage, and things started to take a turn, but fortunately I was able to stabilise and start moving the parts again. The end of the assault wave timing couldn't have been better, but I was still far too lazy with my approach to this section of the heist, going through most of my FAKs in a mad scramble to drop the parts on the road, whilst being absolutely peppered by unkillable snipers. I'd need a solution for them, sooner rather than later, if this run was going to succeed. Despite multiple close calls, with my perk deck lacking any real survivability at this point, I was able to open the vault and painstakingly lockpick the deposit boxes, eventually finding some money, which I nearly died with when trying to raise a balloon for escape. As we'll find throughout this run, the addition of the US Marshals and Shields have made this challenge format much more difficult, leaving me with only a handful of first aid kits by the time all was said and done. I've learned my lesson though, over the course of playing through previous challenges, as instead of trying to fruitlessly defend the cage, I simply went to secure another loot bag for the escape, meaning all I now had to do was wait out the pilot's arrival with my last remaining Molotovs, slap some shield marshal ass, and make for the sewers as soon as the opportunity presented itself, allowing me to clear a real early game roadblock heist on only my second crack of the whip. This was the turning point in the entire run, as I was finally able to access one of the three main weapons available to me in the rule set, the Flamethrower MK1. With the ammo boost and rare modification, it was sure to never run dry on fuel. Alongside the over 9000 saw, which I'm allowed to use, just not deal damage with, I was easily able to carve through Transport Park, as the flamethrower already one-shots anything with less than 600 health, and for everything else we can simply tap fire or incapacitate them to follow up with a swift palm to the chin. I think on the spy run I might have really offended one of the payday gods, as yet again I was given the sniper escape to contend with, this time needing to move 5 bags throughout the level. But now I had access to an actual weapon, this one wasn't so bad either. Transport Harbour was a slightly different proposition, as it threw an abundance of bulldozers and snipers at me, which will be the problem enemies throughout the entire run. But I was just about able to handle them with a few clutch FAK activations. Loot securing was a mess, but I was still able to get out on my first go around. Naturally, this led to the car park escape, more brutal punishment, as moving five bags through the multi-story is actually a bit of a nightmare. I ended up taking almost the full six minutes it gives you to clear, slowly dragging the loot across the roof, all whilst being harassed by snipers and dozers. I was absolutely damage and mobility deficient for a surprise heist like this one, but after quite the struggle, I made it out with under 25 seconds left on the clock. The many dozer run-ins from that experience reminded me just how important Bloodthirst was from the no shooting challenge, so I quickly picked that up to give my melee damage a much needed boost. Sadly, weapons like the Fire Axe are off limits for this run, as Sociopath requires the weapon to be able to swing more than once per second to activate its damage bonus, which is a frustrating limitation from the roleplaying perspective. I also had the funds remaining to at least attempt to tackle my sniper issue. I could afford the Basilisk 3V Grenade Launcher, a surrogate scorch shot, but without upgrading its accuracy, it would be inconsistent to say the least. Moving on, I've learned my lesson from prior runs at this point, just go loud for the train heist if at all possible, the only caveat being if you don't have an option to deal with snipers. Well, surely this run has just prevented that potential pitfall. You'd think, but the learning curve on this grenade launcher is steep to say the least. One minute you can be cross mapping a sniper with ease, the next you can spend minutes firing shot after shot over the heads of the pesky sods. Where it failed, I still had my Molotovs to steal the deal, but I'd hardly say my sniper problem was completely fixed. Even so, I was able to ignore them for the most part, rotating around 30 minutes into the heist to secure the final batch of bags, only to massively regret that decision after my arch nemesis, this guy next to the escape, managed to land what seemed to be an absolutely back-breaking double shot on me to take me from full health to zero in under a second. These are only mayhem snipers, by the way, and it wasn't just the brutality of the method that hurt on this one, it was the 30 minutes that just went into the ether that really burned. Ah well, what I lack in free time at the moment, I make up for in pure unbridled rage at this heist, which always likes to mess around with me somehow. Run 2 gave me the generally superior boat escape anyway, which should avoid a similar event occurring. 
I just need to chuck the ammo bags down the clearing and then zipline the second set. No problem, I don't even really need to kill that sniper, although he is getting on my nerves. Couldn't hurt to just, oh lord I fell out, let me just FAK. Oh wow, what a ridiculous throw. Let me tell you, I'd much rather fail due to my own stupid mistakes than the game screw me over, but doing so whilst getting meleeed? That's another story when it comes to the old frustration levels. I actually needed to take a break after this one, and it's a good job I did, because 34 minutes into the next attempt and only 4 bags away from escape, a taser managed to land the perfect shot on me directly in a sniper's line of sight, bringing us to over an hour and a half on what is meant to be a regular difficulty heist. Torturous. On the next run, I refused to play with the same lazy style I had thus far, getting revenge on the sniper from run 1, before moving the final bags via the interior of the workshop building, avoiding the constant sniper fire that had me pulling out my hair on those previous failures. Even then, I was nearly shot out of the air meters from escape. Looking at it in hindsight, if that shot had taken me down, this video would have almost certainly not come out this week, as I think that would have sent me on a long-term sabbatical from Payday 2. Finally though, the train heist was complete, meaning we can quickly run through Vlad's much shorter and lower stakes offerings. For more Crasher, I wasn't sure how destructive the flamethrower could be, but was pleasantly surprised to see how successfully it seemed to break everything in sight, whether that would be realistic or not. Of course, it wouldn't be like a pyro to not also set up a little gasoline fire to speed things along. This one was never in any doubt as the sniper spawned in range of the flamethrower, making for an easy clear. On the reprisal of 4 stores, I brought C4 to speed up the thievery process and easily avenge my prior self upon what is a really easy heist when you actually have access to damage dealing weapons. Naturally, this run has been cursed by escapes, so we're sent to the cafe to flee, although without any bags to secure this was basically a layup to grab the cappuccino to go please achievement. Moving on to Ukrainian job, another heist we've already taken care of on this run, I decided to pick up the third and final weapon we'll be making use of, the MA-17 flamethrower, which fits snugly into the secondary slot and actually boasts some fairly impressive concealment. When I pair it with a low detection risk primary, such as the Akimbo Chimano Customs, I can easily put together a low blow build specifically for crits alongside the heavy ballistic vest. Remember, afterburn damage has a chance to crit on every tick, making this an incredibly effective playstyle. For this run, I'll be defaulting to this build whenever I don't need to worry about snipers, as what it lacks in range, it makes up for in its time to kill. As such, it absolutely lays a waste to a high sight Ukrainian job, as I finally have what feels like a weapon to rival the phlogistonator in my arsenal. Yep, as you probably guessed, this takes no skill. In fact, I enjoyed switching my brain off so much that I headed directly into White Xmas with the same build, and similarly, lay waste to everything on that heist. Having inbuilt crits was not only great for my flamethrower, but also my karate, allowing me to tackle bulldozers head on without having saved up 15 plus kills already. However, that small difficulty reprieve wasn't going to last for long. Meltdown is probably the toughest obstacle we have to contend with before progressing onto the Deathwish difficulty, meaning I had to massively overhaul my other build to contend with the litany of snipers that would inevitably try to halt my progression. I grab Bullseye Aced, because surprisingly enough, it is actually possible to headshot with the flamethrower, if only for the purpose of activating this skill, alongside Iron Man Aced for maximum tankiness already. Sadly, maximum tankiness is nothing in the face of Mayhem Skulldozers, who can spawn in the crates on Meltdown, tearing me a new backside under a minute into attempt 1. Now, with this spawn chance fresh in my memory, it was possible for me to avenge my prior self early into run 2, easily opening up the vault from the safety of the warehouse interior. The problem came when trying to actually deliver the warheads via a forklift truck. Whilst I was set up to take out snipers, honestly, the odds of a pipe flying true enough to actually set them alight were slim to none. Basically, I had to either land a direct hit or clip the edge of whatever they were stood on precisely, and that just wasn't happening with my current level of basilisk accuracy. Fortunately, they also didn't seem to be able to land a damn thing onto me when moving at the blistering pace of 5 miles per hour, meaning I was able to get the forklift around the corner and onto the home straight gauntlet. Alas, the appearance of a SWAT turret roadblock was enough to shut down this attempt as yet again I missed an FAK placement. Frustrating, but the first half of the heist had gone fine, so surely that would always be the case. Uh, no. The vault spawned outside for run 3, leaving me exposed to a Skulldozer sniper combo, ending things early. Those dozers do insane damage at this stage of the run, and if I encountered them without stacks of bloodthirst, things got nasty real quick. On run 5, things were lucking up, until I noticed a warhead had casually slipped off my forklift, and once outside a vehicle, the sniper seemed to go from your standard 2 fork gibbous wearing variety to those akin to the aimbot infestation, absolutely ruining me without recourse. 
One more Skulldozer run in later, and I was finally able to make it back to the escape portion of this heist, switching over to the crit setup as I didn't seem to be able to handle snipers anyway. Once again, I was greeted with a swap van turret that was absolutely merciless. There was no way I was going to be able to brute force this, unable to even regenerate armor whilst it pinned me down behind the forklift. I considered trying to wait out its cooldown period and just push when I had the chance, but that was too high risk as snipers could spawn on me at any moment. I had to formulate a plan. First I pondered heading back for the Longfellow to try rushing through the blockade, but the sniper coverage was too much my ballistic vest setup to safely handle. So the call I made was to simply use my slightly elevated speed to rush past the SWAT van and try to force it to reposition. This worked, sort of. I was able to flank around the rear of the train yard, but without any loot to show for my efforts. What it did present me with though was an opportunity. Thanks to Vanilla Hood Plus, I was able to replace my currently lost converts on the opposite side of the map with fresh jokers who could actually provide some sort of distraction. With them on my side, I mustered up the courage to actually fight the SWAT van head on. Flamethrowers are just about suited to degrease a SWAT van, not actually destroy their mechanical parts, but I could deal some damage which was all the license I needed, forcing the gas drops, resetting in cover and rinsing and repeating this high risk process for about 2 minutes, before finally dealing the 7000 damage needed to force it into repairs. This gave me just the window of opportunity to get the forklift around Warehouse 1 and out of what felt like an impossible situation. But we were hardly home free. I had to once again run off to secure some jokers whilst avoiding getting sniped to the best of my ability, very gradually managing to move the forklift once again closer to that sweet escape. But of course, inches from being home free, a couple of the warheads slipped off and I was forced to scramble to load them back up, during which time a second SWAT van moved into position, hell bent on ending the run. I didn't have the ammo to attempt to take this one out, so I was forced to abuse my final few first aid kits to gradually drag the loot around one final corner, where I was seemingly safe and able to secure the bags of the train. Well, that was a painstaking nightmare, and leaves me very relieved that cops seem to just leave you alone during Meltdown's escape section. With the Basilisk failing me so spectacularly on that previous heist, I decided to splash the cash in Continental Coins on a few key attachments, adding a long range sniper scope and massively bolstering its accuracy to a total of 80 in order to make it a more consistent sniper killing tool. Aftershock was a nice opportunity to showcase it in action, as I was finally able to aim true and take out snipers over range, a huge boon for this run. On top of that, I was finally embracing my inner axe extinguisher pyro by equipping the throwing axe in my throwable slot. Unlike melee, which felt a little clunky and was predominantly reserved for bulldozers, the axe can quickly follow up on an incapacitated flaming target and comes in particularly handy up against higher health special enemies. It was a simple holdout at the building site as fire damage is ridiculously good at stun locking groups and holding down entrances or spawn points, leading to a swift completion of this heist. Nightclub is… Uh, it's boring, definitely one of the least enjoyable heists on any run. At least I was able to burn the establishment to a crisp with a little gasoline arson on this one. Outside of all the waiting for drills and escape vans, there's not a lot to talk about here, simply a heist that drags on longer than it should. Moving into stealing Xmas, I actually decided to take a bit of a risk. So far I'd felt pretty unkillable on this run outside of extreme dozer or sniper based circumstances, so I decided to drop first aid kits altogether from my build to instead focus on consistent healing via hostage taker. This opened up a slot for any utility I wanted to bring along to speed up a heist. While not a safe strategy, the gamble went unpunished on this one as I was easily able to cruise through the mall objectives before dealing with the Ruth section thanks to my now much more consistent Basilisk secondary. This brings us on to Watch Dogs and Hector's other rather dated heists. Day 1 is a breeze as I went fairly unchallenged with the crit setup, Day 2 was much of the same, as even Dozers at this point were offering a pretty tame threat on Mayhem to a build with this much damage output, a straightforward escape after 6 minutes. Firestarter was aptly named for a run such as this one, I went into day 1 with C4 to rapidly start burning the weapons, and even without any healing, never looked to be in any danger of going down for a sub 4 clear. Day 2 was a little trickier, but again my utility options sped up the process of actually getting my hands on the servers. Switching over to my heavily armoured build, I was equipped to take out any rooftop snipers, while this was such a tough shot I was forced to gain some high ground before emphatically melting the man through the tree line, granting the space I needed to clear this day. Onto the bank heist section, at least I got to experience the thrill of setting fire to a ton of cash. Other than that, there wasn't a lot to write home about. Once again, flamethrowers are insanely strong when controlling space and avoiding damage, which also comes in handy for a heist such as rats, holding down tight spaces and allowing me to cook almost uninterrupted. Although the temptation to blow the place sky high was there, sadly that's an automatic failure these days of mayhem, so we had to be on our best behaviour and just settle for a pile of charred corpses instead, escaping with relative ease. Day 2 is effectively a non-combat heist, although I couldn't help but set fire to a few gangsters on the way out. 
Day 3 can also be completed under a minute, with all the remaining Mendozas burnt to a crisp and Hector's jobs now clear. Big Oil comes next, and thanks to having two viable builds at my disposal, I was able to shift the crit focus one towards ECM jammers, allowing for a stealth rush of Day 1. After grabbing the address, I was able to switch over to my more armoured build, equipped once again with the saw to gain rapid access to the server room. Keeping the cops off the hack is never the easiest solo, with multiple power boxes around the house, but with the assistance of jokers and incendiary stun locks, preventing half the threats of the map from even moving, this wasn't as bad as it had been in the past. I'm also intimately familiar with all the principles of nuclear fission at this point, at least if Payday 2 is as accurate to the real world as I hope it is, finding the correct engine with little fuss and holding out for the escape away from the prying eyes of snipers. A clean first time clear, and what can be a tricky heist. The same can be said for framing frame. I wanted to try a little 75 detection risk stealth approach, and bumped into the 10% chance of this guard spawning in the bathroom, which took me hours to force back when I made that video on Payday 2's random variations. Unsurprisingly, the stealth was a bust, but I brought along a saw in any case to quickly gain access to the security room and break the bars protecting the marked paintings. It was a little touch and go on the way out without first aid skills, but this was still a fine clear for day one. Naturally, this was followed by the coffee shop escape as I'm fated to suffer as many escapes as humanly possible, but that wasn't going to make any significant impact on the heist while still pre-Deathwish. I was so rapid on day 2 that I actually managed to witness the cop ambush spawning directly in front of me, meaning I was just meters from escape by the time they had their bearings. Oh, and then I had to do another brief escape heist. I'm starting to get the impression that the Washington PD don't appreciate being set ablaze. Just a hunch though. Day 3 can be quite a challenge. More than any other heist in the game, the cops seem to be incredibly good at focusing the power supply during the framing process, meaning what could be a sub 10 minute heist is almost always dragged out. With limited healing, this did increase the risk we faced, but as an entirely close quarters heist, I was comfortably able to limit that risk by critting everything in sight. Once again, being able to run freely between power box locations and maintain stun locks whilst doing so meant that this heist was a lot harder for the cops to disrupt than it had been in the past, completing the hack in under 15 minutes with only a body count in the 200s for once. That's what we get for being surprisingly efficient. On day 1 of election day, I made a clean getaway despite things going loud by tagging the correct truck and heading into the more stealth orientated day 2. Of course that wasn't really the plan as I was more than happy to go and hack the voting machines in loud. This was easy to complete inside the warehouse, although I did forget that there is a 6 minute 40 second hack I have to wait out straight after. This is why no one plays this heist in loud. Also, the small squadron of snipers were an absolute nightmare to hit for the Basilisk, which seems to be the case for any snipers that spawn outside the actual playable map, as the buildings don't always have clear and distinct hitboxes. Not the end of the world, as they could be avoided easily enough, until I was forced to take a risk and sprint for the escape, dodging enough of the impressive laser light show to clear the heist with just a sliver of health remaining. Honestly, that was a stupid risk to take, and I would have been furious had I wasted that 50 minute attempt on a play that brainless. I'm taking that as some karma coming back to me after the sadness of Train Heist though. Big Bank is up next, and I was decently lucky to find the right PC early on. This got me through the time lock portion of the heist quickly, as I set up the thermite to enter the vault in the only way an arsonist ever would. On previous runs, I've been over level 80 for Big Bang, so no I can complete it on Deathwish, meaning this mayhem attempt was never really in any doubt, as I torched every cop in sight whilst the thermite went to work, using the C4 to quickly grab 4 bags of loot and securing it via my usual elevator shaft escape method. This left us only 4000 experience away from level 80, which is kind of a relief, allowing me to take on Hotline Miami as one final mayhem heist. Based on the difficulty I had with it, this may have just saved the run, at least it saved the use of one lifeline, as attempt 1 was cut short when I was caught out in the open still trying to set the cars alight after snipers had already started spawning. A recipe for disaster with no healing equipped. I made it one step further on run 2, heading to grab the C4, but was almost instantly one shot by a trifecta of snipers across the rooftops. Obviously this wasn't something I could just hope to play around. On run 3 I noticed how satisfying it was to blast the planted C4 with a flamethrower, increasing the speed of my mobs to take down, which was key to getting in position prior to the snipers spawning in. Don't ask how the flames are coming out of my axe. By setting up at the gas station, I was just about in range of these problem enemies, whilst also having cover I could dart behind, finally succeeding in wiping all three off the map before tackling the rest of the car burning. Without red lasers pointing at my head, it was easy enough to get the objectives moving, taking down the gas station and, once again, clearing the way to set up the winch and gain access to the basement. Once inside, things were much more simple as I just had to burn anything that got close, escaping by flanking and remaining out of sight of the fresh wave of deadly snipers. Not out of the woods yet though, as early into day 2 I was given that nostalgic experience of the classic green dozer combo, melee for the armour, point blank shotgun shell for the instant down. I haven't missed that sensation one bit. 
Heading back in, I decided to go all scorched earth and simply sprint through as quickly as possible, giving all the white jacket mobsters the full bat burner treatment. Once up on the roof, I still had to face the very real danger of a sniper firing squad and more green dozers who just love fighting at close range. If it wasn't for sociopath's elite armor gating abilities, I absolutely would have been toast on this heist. But with the Basilisk culling the sniper's numbers and basically turning this hallway into a fire trap, it was easy to hold out amongst the flames and simply repair the drill within my own natural habitat. Once into the vault, the Commissar went down in a few swings and I was free to escape this heist, along with it, the safety of Mayhem difficulty. Death wish all the way from here on in, which brings a whole new set of complications. Fortunately, and just in time, I was now able to complete the Sociopath Pert deck, with Showdown bringing a powerful disruptive stun ability that meant even if someone wasn't smouldering, they'd probably still be reacting poorly to the deaths of their melting comrades, and as such, unable to shoot me. I'd also recently grabbed enough skill points to pick up Feign Death Ace, a skill that grants us a 45% chance to instantly revive after going down, which is specifically very powerful when heisting without AI. Holston Breakout is first on the list of Death Wish Heights, except I somehow managed to pick it up on Death Sentence without realising, which went about as well as you'd anticipate. This is the exact reason why we don't do these challenge runs on the hardest difficulty in the game. With the other rules in place, it would be essentially impossible to put together any sort of interesting playthrough. For reference, Fane Death kept activating all the way into custody, but even so, I never stood a chance. I was briefly panicking, as I thought this was only Death Wish at first, but soon realised my mistake and returned to the correct difficulty. Once bitten, twice shy though, as I decided to default to safer first aid kit strats almost immediately. Even with this extra precaution, I still needed Fane Death's assistance under 2 minutes into the heist. After that scare though, I was finally able to get a grasp on proceedings and start pushing along the streets of DC with my jokers. The difficulty jump was noticeable, and it comes at a bad time with Hotstone Breakout always being a challenge, but once around the final turn of the gauntlets, after landing this gloriously arcing throwing axe, we were almost home free, using the saw to drill into the control room, narrowly avoiding death by Skulldozer, and escaping to the more manageable day 2. I say manageable, but 20 seconds in I was reminded of just how easily the FBI units can melt your health pool. Fortunately, once these guys were out of the way, I was able to start knocking off the objectives and keeping most enemies at bay with the crit flamethrower. A double minigun dozer spawn in the lobby nearly did me in, but my crit kung fu knew no bounds and I was able to push my way out of this tricky situation, returning to Hoxton to escape with the FBI server right as the assault wave died down. That one was pretty satisfying, taking us directly onto Hoxton Revenge, a heist that's difficulty is almost entirely dependent on whether you can kill the snipers that spawn in. Well, I could do that, but the idea of fighting two school dozers at once was still a bridge too far at the moment. Knowing these were fixed spawns, I was slightly better prepared for them on the next attempt, flanking around the main floor and sufficiently confusing their AI to the point that this was looking more like a scout run than pyro. Those out of the way, I just had to recover the thermal lance without being sniped to oblivion, which was easily done as they'd yet to spawn. As you know, at this stage, once I've got a nice place to hole up in, the heist is all but complete, dispatching any unlucky snipers and maintaining total control of the vault area of the heist. Hector was given the usual treatments, meaning we just had to secure the evidence by rooftop. Once again, sniper control was key, but I was finally getting a good feel for the Basilisk grenade arc, wiping them off the map in a single shot each and escaping one of my cleanest Totsdam revenge runs ever. The Diamond is the dentist's next heist and is still one of the easiest in the entire game. Spawns are ultra predictable, there are a few impactful sniper spawns and I was finally able to embrace my true WM1 pyro and just hold down that left click until everything stopped moving. I did slip up on the tile puzzle but that just meant more time barbecuing the competition, another really easy clear. Golden Grin can be annoying, solo loud, but I've been getting better at it run after run so I wasn't too concerned going in. As ever, my main enemy is overconfidence as I took a nosedive off the balcony, missed the swimming pool and ended up drowning myself on attempt 1. This was just a blip though as on the next run I was able to get the winch dropped in, create an array of gravity defying snipers and get the BFD set up. Despite a few close scrapes, I was able to keep the laser cutter going and shortly gain access to the dentist Illuminati Happy Meal box, a nice heist to get out of the way so easily. With my well-trained fear of snipers, the bomb dockyard was our logical next destination, with Fane Death once again paying for itself to save me the embarrassment of failing the heist to basic security, and then again about a minute later when I can only assume I was bulldozed to the dirt. The beauty of the dockyard is that you can reach most sniper spawns with just a flamethrower, that is until you're trapped on the opposite side of the map from them defending the hack, then you just have to pray. Fortunately it seems my prayers were heard as I was able to get the ship moving despite the lasers trained on my spine and then wrap my way around the left side of the docks to dispatch the problem swats. 
From there, I simply need to find and start moving the bomb parts, while still living in fear of the snipers that could prematurely end me. This was touch and go at times, with marshals providing another constant annoyance later into heist. I've honestly done these guys dirty in prior videos by saying they can't hit the broad side of a barn. On heists that aren't specifically Midland Ranch, they actually have some of the best AI in the game, setting up in Overwatch locations and using their superior range and lack of drop off to pest you consistently and quite effectively. So fair play to them, I think I'm actually a fan. Well, at least I am in concept. Right now, in the context of this run, they're a massive annoyance, but still not on the level of the old fashioned snipers, as these two thought they were going to have their anime moment, slotting the perfect helix of shots between the bridge of the ship and its haulage, dropping me in an instant, 23 minutes and one bomb part away from completion. Mercifully, Fain Death hit him with the Uno reverse and I was able to slink out just seconds later. That would have been another tough late throw to take. Now, Scarface Mansion normally causes me quite the headache, but for once I'm happy to say this just wasn't that bad. After I survived a nasty run in with a Skulldozer and Minigun Dozer duo, things were smooth sailing, hacking access to the mansion interior, ruining Ernesto's day, and then spending more time than I'm happy to admit staring at a roof turret hoping that, I don't know, it would blow itself up until I remembered that, strangely, throwing axes are their kryptonite. Sosa's boys had been working on their synchronized dance moves for me, which just left the boss himself, whose day got even worse. I had some difficulty taking out the snipers covering my escape, but persistence and a steady flow of healing meds won out as I carved a path to victory without even having to lean on the crutch of feigned death for once. For the crime spree, I bashed out Santa's workshop, which offered absolutely zero challenge, so we can move on to either the Alesso heist or counterfeit. Well, I've actually never chosen to go down the Alesso Heist route on a challenge run, and I feel like pyrotechnics should be right up my alley, so let's do it. This heist is a bit of a slog, bearing in mind each stock room door takes 20 seconds to lockpick, after which we have to handle a fiddly forklift section, push some buttons to enhance Alesso's set, and then perform the blasphemous action of putting out a fire. I'm not sure that sits well with the ethics of this run. Oh well, it won't matter soon enough, as whilst trying to secure the loop from the lobby, after 27 minutes of annoying objectives, the Black Ismadoza showed his true potential, taking me from full health and armor to none of either faster than I could even react. Like hell was I running that one back and putting out more fires, there's a reason why we choose counterfeit for these runs. During the stealth portion it looked like we'd gone back in time and reactivated the counterfeit stealth glitch by lobotomizing this police officer, but eventually he pulled himself together and called for backup. However, the damage was already done at that point, as it meant that I was able to access the printing press before snipers even had the chance to start spawning, making for an incredibly trivial escape in about a third of the time the Alesso heist takes. First World Bank continues the classics, giving me another opportunity to showcase my improved basilisk skills, landing 50 meter pipes to keep on top of the sniper population. I felt pretty well equipped for a heist such as this one with excellent close range crowd control, insta kills with a throwing axe, and sociopaths innate survivability. I was also getting very good at just running past most enemies on the map and tap firing the flamethrower to leave them to their smouldering business, a surprisingly effective strategy that I'm coining the gas passer, as the initial stun would be stretched out as 480 health cops went down and showdown kicked in. Even dozers were presenting far less of a challenge than they had been earlier in the run as I was starting to perfect my melee application and positioning. Sadly though, running headlong into a posse of three scripted green dozers is still not advisable, turning my ICTV into Swiss cheese and putting me in the dirt. Run 2 was almost identical to the first, although this time I actually gave the greens the space they deserve, which would later come back to haunt me as it seems they decided to group up next to the office escape, giving me a nasty surprise after c 4 my way out, very nearly deleting me for a second time, if not for a clutch FAK. The strangest thing about this is that the cops actually followed me into the garage, the first time in my memory deciding to contest the escape and give me the fright of my life. You can absolutely see the surprise from how the gameplay starts to break down. Oh well, another heist in the books, time now for me to put together the first and only dedicated stealth build for this challenge. It's not really in Pyra's nature to go in without making a mess, but thanks to the spare points I had hanging around, I could actually grab 4 perks in Yakuza and enjoy the pain of my own cleansing molotovs to set up for maximum speed. Also, it's only right that I use the Fire Axe in at least one build for this run, so despite not being a fast or concealable option, it is going to be our core method of dispatch. Murky Station is not a particularly challenging stealth heist, even without having a ranged weapon, so we were able to cruise through and escape with ECMs and a little additional axe murder. Boiling Point is Jimmy's second contracted heist, and I always reiterate this, but it's marginally harder than other Death Wish heists due to its unique enemy variants, making this a good litmus test for just how strong our build now is at level 90. Well, not for the first time on this run, a swift gunbutt to the sternum had me tumbling early on, but Fame Death once again saved the day, showing that any build can look great with the right RNG. 
Even so, I was becoming the Grim Reaper for heavy bulldozers all across the world, easily defending and scanning the one required test subject before quickly grabbing the server and heading to the surface. You see, I've learned that you can sometimes just beat the snipers to spawning if you go fast enough. That or Payday 2 is a broken game. Both of those statements can be independently true. Looking back at my very first challenge run, the lack of snipers was key to my success, and once again I was able to lug the server all the way to the clearing by the escape before they even spawned in. You can see the exact moment from the hood. This made what can be a very tricky escape absolutely trivial, so another first time clear that I was more than happy to get out of the way. What I wasn't happy to see was that my long term nemesis, the biker heist, was on the horizon. But first, I needed to dust off another Santa's workshop made slightly harder by being set on Deathwish rather than Crime Spree, but still nothing to write home about and a run of the mill completion. Back to stealth, and I could get a little axe murder going on the old car shop, chopping down most people I saw Alan meet the pyro, before boosting the Falcogini and driving off into the sunset. As I foreshadowed though, the biker heist now looms large for us, and I shudder to imagine the dreams of chronic and sustained cruelty the designers of this heist had. It's everything that causes issues to our build rolled up into one. Limited cover, snipers, specifically those that spawn outside of the map, a SWAT van turret that literally cannot be destroyed by our build, and of course, RNG objectives we have no control over. Which is why I was absolutely shocked when I quickly grabbed the mechanic's tools before the first assault even started, cruised through the Chrome Skull objective, and was easily able to secure the seat from the bunker basically uncontested. Even after spawning a Hydra of cops, it didn't look as if anything could stop me from clearing my least favourite heist in Payday 2. As I had the safer van spawn, I didn't even really need to wait out until the end of the assault to hop on the bike and start driving directly into the world's most camouflage barrel, which was just inches away from a first aid kit that would have absolutely saved the run until I rolled just out of its range, going down and failing in crushing fashion, a genuine controller breaking loss. Once I finally recovered mentally from it and was ready to go again, surprisingly I had full belief that for once, Biker Heist should be mine. This time I was not blessed with good RNG, as the mechanic placed himself right outside the SWAT van turret's line of sight, leading to multiple mad FAK scrambles keeping me just about afloat. Holding out in the clubhouse, I was less bothered by snipers, but absolutely inundated with dozers charging my position. I also rolled the dreaded garage objective, which was nearly the end of attempt 2 when a pair of school dozers cornered me, only for feign death and a first aid kit to salvage the run after a flurry of swings. As I stabilised with the Joker once again, it became comparatively easy to hold down and protect the mechanic's position, which once complete, left me just needing to make it to the escape. Before that, I flanked around and made short work of the overwatching snipers, and for once actually was patient enough to wait for the fade in the assault, clearing all major threats off the map before making a break for it. As I flew around that first corner, I genuinely breathed a sigh of relief, as that pretty much guarantees access to day 2. Correct me if I'm wrong, but only one failure on Biker Heist Day 1 has to be a challenge run record. The train run on Day 2 was also surprisingly fun. There's something about that rush flamethrower playstyle that just really gets the adrenaline pumping. Not to mention, I could actually shoot the snipers out of the helicopters for once. Of course, a dozer managed to pull off their now trademark melee combo to force out another feign death proc, but I refused to waste that opportunity, and with sociopath and melee skills, the biker boss wasn't long for this world. The run back was very similar, except I gave the dozers just a little more respect. A fun first time clear. Of course, the biker heist completion just heralds more sniper based misery for us as we tackle Panic Room. This heist is a big part of why the Basilisk made it into the rule set, so now was its chance to prove itself. As usual, the initial soaring objectives weren't a problem, it was always going to be the sniper section that gave the pyro bill problems. However, now I actually understood how to aim our surrogate flare gun, things were a whole lot easier. Although some shots felt really pressured, and I was already piling up corpses to try and create space, we were making progress quite consistently. The final sniper went down after 16 and a half minutes of scrapping, but we weren't out of the woods yet. In their place were the genuinely dangerous US Marshals, who've worked out that you don't need to be point blank to deal solid damage to a heister. These guys, along with some really persistent tasers, made c 4 the rooftop a living nightmare. One shudders to imagine what inhuman thoughts lie behind those masks, those damn Bellmead sharpshooters. That's the actual canonical name by the way. After quite a few minutes of persistence and a little help from Die Hard, we'd finally made a sufficiently impressive hole in the roof. Just a case now of defending the helicopter, which was well timed with the slow start of a new assault wave, allowing for a far less contested escape than usual. Panic Room is always an epic of a heist, with an insane body count, so I'm relieved to see it clear. I'd say the Basilisk has done its job and paid back that 3 quid 50 investments I made for the demo run.
but it still had more heavy lifting to do on Brooklyn 1010. It was at this point I decided I'd need more of a consistent lifeline moving forwards, so I decided to drop the health regeneration of Hostage Taker for Messiah Basic, giving me the chance to self-revive and not rely so heavily on feigned death going off. The first section of Brooklyn 1010 basically just consisted of me raining down Hellfire on the streets below. From there, I could push on to the sniper section, remembering to try and stay mobile as in the past I'd been known to get bogged down here and completely overrun. A taser managed to hold me still for a takedown, but my auto revive kept us going after clearing out the gangsters. Unfortunately, due to the weird geometry of the building across the road where the snipers spawn, actually landing a fire pipe in there felt incredibly hit or miss. I was so distracted concentrating on this that the Skulldozer managed to sneak up behind me and put an end to this run immediately. No way was I killing him in time to activate Messiah. It didn't take long to get caught up again on run 2 though, and this time I was just a little more patient, making sure I dealt with dozers before trying my luck with the snipers. Even with the extra caution, Messiah soon had its first save, using the throwing axe for an instant revive. After 14 minutes of running cops around this section, I finally landed the shot on the last sniper and headed down to the ground level. Sometimes, this is the hardest part of the heist, but for this build, it was surprisingly easy for me to push aggressively against the oncoming wave and move the cop cars almost immediately, a clean getaway on the last of these sniper-centric missions. Yacht Heist is next, and after remembering that throwing Molotovs on densely populated boats is not a great idea, I put together one of the best true RNG stealth heists I ever have, finding 6 of 8 money bags within the first minute and a half of the run. The last two were found shortly after, meaning I could head down to the server room, take out the only remaining guards in my path, and clear this heist in 4 minutes 38 seconds, smashing the 6 minute requirement of Thalassophobia without even meaning to. Undercover is another sniper heavy heist, but as you don't need to take them out, I decided to go back to the crits to have more close range control. This ended up being a great call as the limo fell into the stairwell and I was able to board up the torture room to effectively pretend the snipers didn't exist for almost the entirety of the heist. I was also able to perform all three hacks virtually uninterrupted, making this one of the smoothest undercovers this series has ever witnessed. The escape was, not for the first time, a little risky, but with some FAK juggling, I was able to make a leap of faith into the escape without killing a single sniper. This challenge has been brilliant for picking up new achievements. Slaughterhouse might present an unfortunate turning point for this run though. When I think about the things I've struggled with so far, you know, snipers, SWAT turrets, carrying 8 bags of some of the heaviest loot in the game, it ain't looking promising. A couple of dozers came along to further emphasise these concerns just a few minutes into run 1, dropping me straight to the ground without a chance for Messiah to activate. Yet attempt 2 was a little bit of a god run. Picking up Counter Strike for 3 skill points had been a surprising game changer, as I was now able to melee dozers without fear of a swift punch of retribution, moving the first few bags to the end of the conveyor belts without too much contestation from the cops. I was forced to waste Messiah around 9 minutes into the heist, and I was given a bit of a panic attack when this dozer learned not to go in for the punch, and yet again ended up being saved by the 45% chance of faint death activating. I had a few mad scrambles once back inside the slaughterhouse, moving the last 5 bags all at once, but I was able to buy enough time stunlocking the assault wave to start pushing against the army of dozers sent my way. Now just the small issue of the snipers. These guys were a nightmare to hit from the safety of the warehouse, so I was instead forced to clear the roof behind me and just risk it moving against those on the freight containers. Once inside, next to the loot drop off, I could clear the way to actually secure all 8 bags without any AI assistance. I've learned that your best bet from there is just to hide and stay completely out of the open, funneling the problem enemies into the range of my axes and hatchet. 28 minutes into this absolute slog of a heist, and the escape had opened itself up. I wouldn't need a second invitation to burn the fire trap and successfully clear one of the hardest heists in the entire challenge, with three lifelines unbelievably still intact. The start of Locke's heist heralds the final stretch of this challenge is upon us, so let's knuckle down for Beneath the Mountain. I didn't run into too many problems accessing the compound, but then, after celebrating the perfect sniper takedown at the airlock, I was reminded that this difficulty's true snipers are the schooldozers. What a waste of a promising run. Attempt 2 was slowed down by a frustratingly located roof turret, but eventually I was back to where I'd fallen previously, murdering that scripted dozer spawn. Stealing the two loot items wasn't really the hard part here, it was securing them when out in the open that would inevitably cause the headache. So long as I could keep on top of the sniper population, it wasn't the end of the world, but I was forced out in the open with, a, I don't know, a minigun dozer completely outside of my damage range, walking so slowly that he was effectively overwatching the final objective, that might be an issue. Oh, goody. 
Eventually, with a bit of tenacity, a few close calls, and the use of my messiah charge, I was able to force through the final satellite's destruction and hide out while the chopper was refueled, as the dozer and its sniper mate seemed to exist outside of my damage range and continued to rain down bullets right up until the eventual escape. With that one feeling so difficult, I was far from pumped to head into Birth of Sky and suffer more sniper-based torture. Run 1 pointed the weird damage disparity between regular units and bloody beat cops on Death Wish. These guys deal far too much damage for their apparent threat level, chewing me out and failing the run from about 30 meters away. On attempt 2, I once again tore up the plane, one-shotting every murky on board, and got to moving the money bundles as quickly as possible. I've learned that if you find a pallet immediately, there's nothing stopping you heading over to the broken pallet and starting to prep for reloading that one whilst you wait for Locke to pick up, massively speeding things along and reducing the time you have to spend dodging lasers later in the heist. This was hugely effective, allowing me to move two pallets in about 6.5 minutes. Snipers only just got to spawning at this stage, which meant that the final objective, which was mostly inside, was no trouble at all. As such, we were able to circumvent the hardest element of this heist completely, attaching the final pallet to the chopper and breaking for the sewers before the SWAT vans even had the chance to get revving. Damage is the key factor for pushing through the sewer grates, but second to that is survivability. As this build is so good at stunning units and general crowd control, it was easy for me to beat down the only dozer and simply charge aggressively at the remaining cops underground, holding them in place whilst I gained access to the boat, and ultimately the escape. After passing some of the toughest tests Payday 2 has to offer, of course I got wiped out by a couple of black dozers on the next heist. Heat Street really isn't that difficult though, as I'm more than accustomed to setting things on fire to force Matt out of hiding, and was able to hit a clutch sniper takedown to reach the final straight of this heist quickly. This shield marshal seems to be confused about how his unit is even meant to work, and despite one of the greatest get down Mr. Presidents I've ever seen from this medic, it wasn't enough to stop us pushing up the street. More marshals did their best, but were nowhere near enough to stop us easily exfilling with Roscoe in tow. Green Bridge is another notoriously problematic heist. The initial prisoner search has to be one of the most intense assault rushes I can ever remember facing, forcing out multiple consecutive first aid kits and even feigned death. Honestly, if I hadn't found the prisoner in the first truck I opened, this might have been a hard reset for the run, but as I did, the timing ended up being almost perfect to push into the scaffolding section off assault. My new favourite thing in Payday, by the way, is landing incendiary grenades on SWAT choppers from across the map. Super satisfying. Although there was a bit of a roadblock at the entrance, we were able to set up and ready to defend the roof from an intense assault. I saw my life flash before my eyes, trying to take out two score doses at once, but eventually managed to break the assault down and easily control the space with my flamethrower. Once the pilot finally landed the pickup, it was time to escape. With the limited resources remaining, it was absolutely pivotal that I played it clearly from here on in, quickly landing a really smooth double takedown with all my bloodthirst stacks before bucking it for an escape. Alas, I couldn't outrun my fate, falling just 60 meters from safety, but in a truly shocking turn of events, I then landed the most clutch flare shot I will ever make, taking down the sniper that killed me before entering custody and somehow activating Messiah in what has to be one of the closest calls this series has ever seen. No time to celebrate though, we need to go and get betrayed in Alaska, easily making it to the boat, freeing the captain and refueling with very few interruptions along the way. These sort of defense objectives are the pyro builds absolute bread and butter, meaning we singed our way out of this one with ease. The Diamond Heist is the final classic for this run, and I've brought back the crits as I want to go as far in stealth as possible to make things easier. I managed to get the hacks going, sent Garnet Jr. to sleep permanently, but did eventually slip up, forcing us into loud for the second half of this heist. I actually forgot just how jarringly brutal Bane's execution of the CFO is, but after witnessing that atrocity, we just had to handle the diamonds across the rooftop without being shut down by the vault turret. Originally, I planned to use the cops to actually move the loot out of the vault and circumvent that issue altogether, but in the end, I was able to move quite safely between cooldown periods and secure another unchallenged completion. Day one of Reservoir Dogs is never much of a challenge, so we breeze through, covering Mr. Pink, finding the diamonds almost immediately, and escaping to the more problematic day two. The ambush alone here is twice as difficult as the first day, using up copious amounts of first aid, feign death, and even messiah, thanks to afterburn, when tackling the initial assault. Crits would have been nice to have for this section, but I needed to pat the basilisk to have a chance at the snipers later in the heist. This build decision seemed to pay off, as once into the vault I was comfortably able to handle everything spawning within the building, whilst also keeping the sniper population to a minimum. Once the assault wave ended, I sent the diamonds to the street below, and despite a few really close calls, was able to load them all into Mr. Blonde's car. I didn't really want to risk another mad dash for the escape, but spotting two minigun dozers lumbering slowly around the corner sort of made my mind up for me, throwing a Hail Mary and sprinting to the escape, fortunately relatively unscathed. 
Brooklyn Bank is really a gimme this far into a run like this one, mostly taking place at close to medium range, allowing me to easily control the flow, mash some dozers and escape in under 10 minutes without any major events. With yet another first time clear, you might be asking, is this challenge viable for general gameplay? And in all honesty, I think it kind of is. It's far from optimal having to go around desperately trying to land grenades on snipers' heads, but the sociopath flamethrower combo really feels natural, with the flamethrower controlling space very successfully, and sociopath offering tons of survivability and spike damage up against large threats. As a result, this has been one of the most fun runs for me to play, although I know you guys won't be happy without a little more struggle, so let's give you what you want, shall we? Breaking Feds is always a late interruption in whatever I'm trying to get done, and run 1 was an almost immediate failure. Great to see. However, this time I was packing C4 for the center mode and actually prepared for a bit of struggle. So on attempt two, I set up around Garrett's office, was forced to be insanely patient when these guards kept looping around the door, but always had an idea of where all four of them were, meaning I never needed to take unnecessary risks and quite out of character, managed to grab the coffer without any further stupid mistakes or Garrett-based murder. Henry's Rock is up next, a long and challenging heist, but one that I was absolutely cruising through, having only used a few FAKs by the time I was set up the turret section. But despite all of that, all it took was a single bulldozer to run over, corner trap me and decimate the run before waddling off like he had something better to do. The absolute disrespect. Also, there was like 0.2 of a second where I could have Messiah revived, but going down completely prevents that, which I think is actually stupid. If you've managed to kill whilst downed, you should be able to revive from any state. Just an idea. Attempt 2 naturally went much worse, I was bullied during the lockdown hack, destroyed by a dozer in the weapons room, but saved by feigned death, and then left with only 5 remaining FAKs by the time I was back to where I last failed. But this time, I wasn't just going to hole up. Staying on the move and burning everything in sight is how the flamethrower likes to be used, and that more active strategy resulted in me successfully switching the turrets off this time around. I did come millimetres from death whilst holding out for the escape and really impatiently rushed it once the chopper did arrive, but this time my confidence went unpunished. Fair to say that victory without hardship is no victory at all, so really I'm grateful to that disrespectful dozer from earlier. Shacklethorn Auction lends itself better to my close range build, which was now fully decked out after hitting level 100. I wanted to stealth the early stages of this one, which worked fine, except I completely forgot to find the blowtorch before going loud. This left me trying to complete 20 second lockpick animations whilst being charged down by an assault wave. Not a great situation to find yourself in. Deeper into the heist, I ended up at the mercy of a taser, who generally can't shock you from outside the flamethrower's range, but this guy decided to be an exception to the rule and mess me up big time before a really lucky escape. That relief wouldn't last for long after I was deleted by this black dozer for daring to try and open a door. The run back went a little bit better in stealth as I was able to both open up the auctioneer's office and secure the blowtorch before things got heated, and from there push into the vault with the code. My progression was gatekept by a taser minigun dozer combo, but this time Messiah actually went to work, bringing me back from the dead and giving me the opportunity to get some sweet revenge. Some awful dozer spawn luck at the escape could have been a nasty curveball right there, but I was able to get one foot on the platform before they taught me a new one clearing one of the final heists in the run. Hell's Island is the perfect heist for a challenge such as this, with dozens of close range spawn points that I'm able to lock down permanently. After freeing Bane, I did have an awkward run at the first set of gates after this guy managed to catch my bloodthirst decks for his dozer friend, but with a bit of running around in circles, I was able to confuse the AI for long enough to take him down. I brought along this build specifically to take care of that sniper once we'd made it back outside, but was a little confused as to whether my flamethrower kills were counting to move locks through the section. You see, you can time out on the escape, and lock is programmed to only move once you've killed a certain number of mercenaries. For whatever reason, although my HUD tracks kills, Payday 2 does not account for units taken down by afterburn damage, so I could be in trouble here. However this is intended to work, lock was really slow to move Bane to the final hack but my setup was good enough at defending the area that even with the initial holdup, we were able to make it to the escape with about 10 seconds to spare. This brings us to the past and no mercy, a joke of a heist to appear this late into a run, but also a perfect opportunity to show exactly why the pyro build is so strong. After about 10 minutes, the lobby was turning into a scene straight out of Meet the Pyro, just without the babies and balloonicorns and the added effect of screams. You know, everything being on fire might have fried a lesser PC, but not an Apex which don't forget you can still pick up from my partner store with Apex Gaming PCs for a smooth 60 frames per second, even with 300 SWAT bodies covering a 10 meter radius. If that doesn't sell it to you, I don't know what will. Regardless of the carnage, I was able to smack a few final dozers before securing the blood samples and my escape from the basement. Which leaves us with the one and only White House standing in the way of pyromanic dominance. The plan was simple, 
go with the crit build, but stealth at least up to the Piog, that way we could avoid the potential of sniper spawns. I awkwardly bumped into a guard on run 1 and decided it would be worth my time to just start over. It seems I was right, as on run 2 we managed to finesse our way into the west wing without any casualties. Here I took out the cameras and the three guards who like to patrol this area, with this lad mercifully doing me a solid and allowing me to quietly answer his mate's pager before accepting an axe to the gut. This gained us access to the presidential safe and the Piot keycard, where unsurprisingly I was spotted starting up the hack. No worries though, this was the exact final combat opportunity I was decked out for. With the crit build, there was no elaborate strategies, just set fire to everything that stands in your way, and that's exactly what I did, holding down spawn points, keeping the power online, and karate chopping a few dozers in the process. This was Pyromania at its absolute best. After a few minutes hacking, I forced my way into the vault, which for a moment looked like it could end up being my final prison, as somehow three minigun dozers were bearing down on me, gradually starting to flank the pillar and power the pressure on. In a moment of do or die, I went for it, sprinting past all three to release the tension and make my way back to the surface. The resistance I met out there defending the anti-air console paled in comparison to what I'd left behind in the Piok, meaning I could chop down one final dozer before Locke arrived at the courtyard and carried us off to complete payday 2 as Team Fortress 2's Pyro. So there you have it, that's another mercenary down. I'm not sure what else needs to be said about the freak that is the Pyro, I'd say this has been my cleanest and overall shortest run, but it was actually also the most intense at times due to having to rely on the Basilisk to take out snipers, which by the way was completely necessary to clear the run. No lifelines used, it's also a bonus, although I know you guys want to see me get a little more creative with them in the future, so we'll try and keep that in mind. Just for a bit of perspective, this was still over 25 hours of gameplay. I first have to play through, then script for, and then edit, which is why these things take weeks to produce. In the past, runs have taken up to 50 hours, so just keep that in mind. It's worth it, especially if you keep enjoying them. That said, thank you so much for watching this video. I'll see you all very soon with the next one. A huge thank you to my dedicated Patreon backers. If you want to join this crew in Going Infamous, check out the link below and pledge as little as $2 to see your name in the credits, or get 24 hour early access to future videos and vote on upcoming content. Take care, I'll see you all soon.